It's now my great privilege to introduce our 2012 Convocation guest speaker, Kevin McGuire. Kevin holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and History from Boston University, as well as a Juris Doctorate from Georgetown University. Kevin has compiled an impressive resume through working with corporations, legislative offices, and state agencies, and in 1991, he founded McGuire Associates, a consulting firm specializing in issues of compliance with federal and state disability-related law. As chairman and CEO of McGuire Associates, Kevin has assisted organizations in effectively and proactively meeting the standards prescribed by the American Disability Act, a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination based on physical or cognitive disability. His firm works with large corporations and large venues such as stadiums, museums, libraries, and theaters in anticipating and responding to barriers to accessibility. McGuire Associates has helped develop and implement technology applications such as websites for people who are blind or partially sighted and or deaf or hard of hearing, state-of-the-art multi-channel assistive listening devices, telecommunication devices for the deaf and hard of hearing, technology <clears throat> for adaptive theater experiences to assist patrons who are blind or partially sighted, um, and museum exhibit guide technology for adaptive museum experiences for visitors with sensory disabilities. The firm has also created a disability evacuation plan to help people with disabilities safely evacuate a building in the event of an emergency. McGuire Associate clients include the TD Garden, Live Nation Ticketmaster, Green Bay Packers, Bank of America, the Los Angeles Lakers, the New England Patriots, Showcase Cin Cinemas, the Boston Opera House, Starwood Hotels. Uh, the San Francisco Giants and Century Fox, as well as the Department of Justice, which seeks the company's assistance during investigations of possible ADA violations. Kevin has given over 500 conferences, trained over 25,000 facility staff people, and lectured widely to conventions, TV audiences, public sector workshops, and corporate compliance executives. He's provided collaborative and technical advising for motion pictures, such as Gattaca, and had an on-screen featured role for Oliver Stone in Universal Pictures, born on the 4th of July. Um, as a nationally recognized accessibility consultant, Kevin is an ideal commencement speaker for Sargent College. He embodies the type of ins inspirational commitment to disabilities right, rights which are taught here at Sargent and practiced by our students and alumni. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Kevin McGuire. Dean Waters, Sergeant, faculty, and other guests, parents, friends, and most importantly, the class of 2012, thank you for the honor for letting me speak to you today. Although I've written an address just to set it up, I'd like you to know that I'm plan on just telling you a little bit about myself, some experiences at BU, um, which helped help me shape my, shape my life. I was given the honor to speak to BU's class of 1990 at their senior breakfast, and while thinking of what to say to them, I made the conscious decision just to speak from the heart, and today I'm going to take that same path. It is really amazing to be here today and share in your celebration. When I graduated, it poured like crazy while we sat on Nickerson Field listening to Dan Rather while our, the red dye from our gowns began bleeding and running onto the clothes we were wearing underneath. And in some ways, it must seem like just yesterday that you moved here to BU in September 2008. Trust me, it will feel the same way 30 years later. Honestly, it only seems like months have passed since I began my BU education. Although I'll tell you more about my car accident in a minute, after I was injured, my entire life was centered around therapy and trying to walk again. I'd wake up and do a series of exercises in the morning, attend school, come home, do additional therapy before I was allowed to go out and play with my friends. I mean, that was my life in focus. And my parents were tough on me. They pushed me incredibly hard. And although I resented them for it at times during my teen years, it was not until I started college before I realized what their sacrifices, what their hard work actually did for me. You have to understand that besides the annual hospital visits, going to college for me was going to be the first time I was away from home. And when I went to depart to BU, my parents purposely went on vacation, so I had to load the car myself and drive to Boston solo. And not sure what the BU or move to BU day like was for you, but for me, it was a hot, hot summer day. And, and during the drive, I began to feel terribly distraught and fearful about what laid ahead. And by the time I reached Hartford, I had to pull off Route 84 because I began to cry. 
And in my mind, I began thinking about turning around and attending the local community college in Orange County, New York. But I made it to BU. And for four years, I lived in Shelton Hall. And when I reached the intersection of Bay State and Deerfield, the two MIT fraternities were in full party mode. And you have to remember, and I'll date myself a little bit, but this was 1979, the Animal House movie era. And these guys had the music blaring, and they were drinking beer from specially engineered kegs and throwing frisbees from their balconies, and they were practically naked. And these guys scared the hell out of me. Um, little did I realize you would never see them again after September 15th, though. <laughs> but to back up, in 1968, at the age of seven, I was struck by an intoxicated driver, which left me paralyzed from the waist down and since forced me to use a wheelchair. It was a freaky accident. I was playing baseball, and this drunk driver literally drove off the road and onto the yard where I stood. I simply did not have enough time to react or to get out of the way. In a nutshell, I heard a scream, turn, and before realizing what was going to happen, I tried to jump out of the way unsuccessfully. The car hit me, threw me 35 feet, and after landing, I was dazed and confused. I could still feel, though, every part of my body ached, my fingers, my, my toes, and my fingernails. My father, who happened to be running, uh, was nearby, came running up to me, and as, he, as we waited for the ambulance, I kept asking him, Dad, what time is it? What time is it? And it was Saturday, August 3rd, a warm evening. And my dad would respond, 7.43, 7.45. And in turn, I kept countering, which probably means nothing to the graduates except for maybe the parents and older guests here. But I said, Dad, we, we got to get home. Get smart starts at 8 o'clock. <laughs> I mean, as a seven-year-old, I had no way of grasping how much my life had already changed. And the initial doctor who treated me in the emergency room saw that my left leg was broken, but inadvertently removed the neck brace, which the volunteer EMTs had put on, destabilizing my neck and not realizing I had a spinal cord injury. And that error is what caused my body to begin shutting down. I was immediately transferred from that hospital, had my last rites read by a Catholic priest, which was traumatic for my mother because he was yelling at me to repent for my sins while I was in this coma. And my mother had to be restrained and retorted, you know, what sins has a seven-year-old committed? But somehow I survived, and although paralyzed from the neck down. And having no use of my arms or my upper body, my fingers or anything, my PTs, OTs began kicking my backside. Massive therapy sessions were initiated, and eventually I regained the use of my upper body. In fact, for the first time that I ever moved my left arm and hand, and I'm left-handed, was when my parents hung a $20 bill over my head, and somehow I was able to swipe it, giving my uh, parents the impression I had Republican leanings of the youngster. <laughs> but after two years of grueling daring, daily, daily work, the paralysis moved down to the waist area, giving me full function of my upper body. And you need to remember, when I was injured, there were NALS laws which protected the rights of people with disabilities. There was no ADA, no Section 504, no Rehab Act of 1973. There wasn't even a concept of mainstreaming. The only laws that protected me were parental. And I tell you this because when I was released from the hospital in March of 69, the district where we lived wanted to place me into special ed. And you need to know that special ed back then is not what happens today. But my parents fought the school district. They argued their son had a physical disability, not an emotional or cognitive one although most of my clients would probably dispute that today. <laughs> and I was fortunate that my parents found Margaret Forey, an old-style, no-nonsense uh, principal at one of the 18 elementary schools in, in our district, who literally allowed me into her building. And I sometimes shudder when thinking about what would have happened had Mrs. Forey not opened her school doors to me. The impact she had on my life was and still is amazing. Again, I was injured in the dark ages of disability rights. It seemed like it was a continual fight just to fight attitudes. And you eventually learn where to pick and choose your battles, because if not, you would drive yourself crazy. It was daily and exhausting. I remember when I was in high school asking the principal for just two accommodations. One was to make the restroom accessible. The other was to construct a curb ramp so I could access the sidewalk, which surrounded this huge uh, building complex. I mean, that little six-inch offset was like a moat without a bridge, denying me the opportunity to independently enter the school. And how did this principal respond? Well, firstly, he removed a door from a stall, making it quote-unquote accessible. Needless to say, I never used that bathroom. Secondly, he put a curb ramp in the, bowels of the, of the back bowels of the complex, which even today modern GPSs couldn't find, forgetting the fact also that that door where it led to was always locked. And applying to colleges was an experience, too. When I visited Fordham in 1978, I quickly discovered their disability services was located on the second floor of a building without an elevator. <laughs> that was a short campus visit. And believe it or not, from a wheelchair accessibility perspective, my college choices were quite limited. There were just a handful of colleges that were accessible. 
Even at BU in 79 and 80, in the early 80s, I had challenges. As a freshman, I was an intern to Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy. And as part of that internship, I was requested to attend a Wednesday evening class with a political science professor who hosted in the brownstones that are across from the castle. However, the professor refused to move the, brown, uh, the class from that brownstone because she liked the setting there, which prevented me from ever attending the class. And when I went to submit my internship paper, she sent out an administrative assistant to meet me on the sidewalk to retrieve. My point is I never, ever met that professor. When I went to visit someone at Warren Towers, I was forced to ride the freight elevator in the back with the fruit and the garbage. It was not until my senior year before that front elevator near the escalators was, um, was put in. Or even in law school, I dated a woman whose parents would not allow me in their home. I was persona non grata. They simply did not want their daughter not, or dating someone using a wheelchair. And I'm not going to lie and say that I still don't wince whenever thinking about these piss past disability-related slights, but you need to know that overall, I have lived a wonderful life. These challenges were molding my character. Last month, I was invited to speak to a middle school in New York. Basically, it was a Q&A session, and the brutally honest, straight from the heart, probing student questions were endless. It was like being in psychotherapy. One sixth grader asked me, are you mad that you had to live your life using a wheelchair? And that particular query caused me to pause. And after reflecting for a few seconds, I told him that my disability has given me great sensitivity towards life, towards other people, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation. Continuing though, I said that I would have preferred living my life as a non-disabled person and would have hoped that because of how I was raised, my sensitivity towards, sensitivity towards others would have been the same. I want to tell you there are two events in my life which defined me as a person and a person with a disability. The first happened in 1971. That fall, I visited Lourdes, a shrine in southern France with my mother. Not certain if you know about Lourdes, and I'm going to impress my mother with my religious knowledge here, but it is where the Virgin Mary allegedly appeared 18 times to a poor, uneducated woman named Bernadette. During one of those visions, a spring began to flow, and supposedly this water has healing powers, and millions of people flock there annually for miracles. And that's why I went to the shrine. My goal to walk again was endless. I mean, my parents did everything to enable me to get out of this chair. Extensive PT, OT, even acupuncture in 1974 and 75, long before it was an accepted practice. But anyway, at Lourdes, you would go into the baths in the morning, you would do it again in the afternoon, there would be a blessing of the sick, you'd then have dinner and come back for this candlelight procession where the attendees would hold candles while singing Ave Maria. The week we were there, there were over 100,000 people from around the world making personal pilgrimages, and most of them there were, were there for a miracle too. But immediately, I realized there were so many other people with disabilities, illnesses, and conditions that were much worse than mine. For the first time, it put my disability in perspective, and somehow I knew I was going to be okay. At that week, during that week at the age of 11, I accepted my disability, and I began praying for everyone else. The second occurred in 1999. My practice has me working for most of the professional sports teams, rock concert venues, theaters around the country. And I also work on many, many cool projects, building projects. And it's not just about physical access. I work with developers and computer engineers and programmers to develop technologies which make websites and visual and audible offerings accessible to people with sensory disabilities. And that's what happened in Cinerama, a movie theater in Seattle. One of my clients is Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft not only related to the Portland Trailblazers and the Seahawks, but also with the Experience Music Project, EMP, and Cinerama. And as we were reconstructing Cinerama, we decided to install this new technology called Mopix, which allows people who are deaf or hard of hearing to hear a movie, and people who are blind and visually, or low vision, to see a movie. We, what, and what you do is you install this LED board in the back of the theater, which is then scrolling the, the, the captioning backwards. So instead of having open captioning like a foreign film run throughout the entire film, again, it runs on this backboard, the captioning backwards. And if you're deaf or hard of hearing, you're given this four by four reflecting little board that's clamped or is attached to a gooseneck, which you then insert into your cup holder. And what you do is you line this reflector to the LED board and to the screen, and alas, you get personal captioning. And so if you're to the right, to the left, behind this individual, you don't see the captioning at all. And if you're blind or low vision, you can hear the movie dialogue, but what if you're at an action movie like The Avengers, 
where they're, everyone is seeing an action scene that runs 45 seconds. I mean, how do they see what you are seeing? So what we do is we digitize the audio narration into the print of the film. And if you're deaf or blind or partially sighted, you're given a headset, and in between the dialogue, what you're seeing is narrated to the person who's blind or low vision. And so as part of the soft, soft, soft op, <laughs> rented lips, as part of the soft opening in 99, we tested the system with the movie The Mask of Zorro. And we invited 70 children from the Seattle area between the ages of 10 and 17 who were deaf, hard of hearing, blind, partially sighted. And for me, it was amazing to observe the kids during the movie. They were both laughing and crying. They were laughing because it was the first time in their lives that they were actually enjoying a film. And they were crying because they were truly enjoying, for the first time, a film. Afterwards, many of them wrote thank you notes to Paul, which he shared with me. One 12-year-old wrote, Dear Mr. Allen, thank you for inviting me to Cinerama to watch The Mask of Zorro. Thank you, too, for the popcorn, the candy, and the soda. And thank you for treating me like a human being. And I could not help stop thinking that if this child thinks that what we're doing is what we should be doing, makes him feel like, you, like a human, then we still have a long way to go. And still today, we're not even close to being where we need to be. I need to tell you that I have been blessed to have three great parents. My father, Jack McGuire, passed away two years after my accident, an accident which broke his heart. But he left me with an important lesson, that you do things for other people without a quid pro quo. You assist others because that's what you are supposed to do. I've also blessed to have an amazing stepfather, John Sullivan, who helped me realize at a relatively young age that life is not black or white, but instead it is 10,000 shades of gray. And conversations with John at an early age taught me not to re react or to respond so quickly, but just to, re just to think about things before reacting or responding. And I have an amazing mother, Agnes Sullivan, is my, who is my anchor, my rock of Gibraltar. She never criticized me when I would feel fearful about my disability, but she never let me wallow in it. She never let, allowed my disability to prevent me from doing what I needed to do or wanted to do. And you need to know the impact that the PTs, OTs, rehab counselors, they've had on my life is amazing. Again, as a seven-year-old quad, my life around all, evolved around all types of therapy. Forgetting the physical work and the constant range of motion exercises, I was playing five different musical instruments. I was weaving hideous looking drugs and making crude uh, hot plates with small ceramic tiles, anything to work on my finger dexterity. And as my upper body came back, I was taught basic skills like dressing, transferring, getting in and out of my car. My relationships with specialists, professionals like you, were too special, too personal to put into words. And graduates, whatever fields you decide to focus, more likely than not, you will have an incredible impact on many lives. I'm simply one example. I've always considered individuals who pursue Sargent College-related programs to be special, unique, and full of compassion. And if I have to leave you with a message, it's don't be afraid to fail. Trust me, my life has been good, but has not been perfect. I've had many failures, some bigger than others. But if you see something, go for it. If you have an idea, chase it. If you want to meet someone, just try to do whatever you can to get in the path, your path, your, or find a way to get into that person's path. I have experienced failure, but I have very, very few regrets. My job with Senator Kennedy was obtained only because he walked by me in the March of 79 while I was visiting DC. I introduced myself, I told him I was attending BU that fall, and he asked me if I wanted to work for him. I landed the role in the movie Born on the Fourth of July only because I read a small article in the New York Daily News while working night court in the Bronx DA's office that Oliver Stone was finally going to produce Born with Tom Cruise. So I finally, I, I found Oliver's address, sent a headshot with a letter, and two weeks later was called in for an audition. Life is experiential. You just keep learning and getting better at as time goes on. And sometimes successes happen accidentally, simply because of timing and circumstances. What works in one interview may not in another. What resonates with one person won't with the next. Trust your instincts when pursuing something. Again, it may not work or prove to be successful, but ultimately, you won't regret the choices that you've made. But before ending, I need to share the same born BU story that I did with the class of 1990 that only BU graduates can appreciate. And I'm going to date myself again, and I'm not even sure most of you even know the movie Born on the Fourth of July. However, if you do rent it, I still get residuals though, okay? <laughs> but it was my very first audition, and I landed a principal role. 
And I ended up working with Tom in all the wheelchair scenes too. But there's this one scene where Tom is now using a wheelchair. He's been injured in Vietnam, and he's in a Long Island bar, drunk, and he's dancing with a young woman named Jenny. And anyway, I told Oliver Stone, Stone this story about the dugout. Do you remember, the, you know, the dugout, right? The Dujo. Um, we used to play uh, O Cannon on the jukebox when I was there. But I wasn't a big drinker in college. But this one night, I had a Cape Cotter, which unfortunately led to a second one. And um, while I was consuming the second, though, I began dancing. And I was popping wheelies with one hand while holding a Cape Cotter in the other, showing off. And people were cheering and egging me on, and they formed a circle cheering. Well, suddenly I realized I was about to lose that wheelie, and I flipped over. And first, everybody was afraid, and he came running up to me, hey, Kev, Kev, you okay, you okay? But I was still so impressed myself, because I had that Cape Cotter in my hand. <laughs> um, and I told Oliver that story, so he worked that into the, into the movie. But graduates, parents, and, and guests, I appreciate you listening to my ramblings. And if you want, please come up and introduce yourselves. I would truly like to meet everyone. And you need to know that I don't consider myself a very religious person, but I'm quite spiritual though. And I'm telling you this because many years ago, my stepfather shared a prayer with me, which I think about every day. And I would like to end it sharing with you. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. And you have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him or her to be. And whatever your labors and aspirations and the noisy confusion of life, be at peace with your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it's still a beautiful world. In 2012, it really is. So you go get them, no regrets. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>